This episode of Untold Stories is underwritten by Lee County Government, County Commission. A thousand years ago, Pine Island was inhabited by an ancient people who lived off the sea, proudly controlled their own destiny, resisted unwanted change, and jealously defended their turf with ferocious tenacity against foreign intruders. The Calusa have been gone for almost 400 years, but their attitude lives on among 21st century Pine Islanders. I think Pine Islanders have inherited that Calusa independence, that fierce determination. Uh, for every modern-day person on Pine Island, there's some 20 Calusa lived and died here, so it's really their island to this day, they're, and they're still here. We're, we're walking on them, actually. Pine Island's always been somewhat fiercely independent. Um, since the early 1900s, when people first started living out here, um, I think you had to be really tough. Any history of Southwest Florida has to begin with the Calusa, for this powerful warrior tribe was the dominant force in the region for centuries. But archaeologists don't agree upon exactly when human beings first came to Florida or even where they came from. In South Florida, and especially in the region that today we call the Domain of the Calusa, we think that people really weren't in this area till about 6,000 years ago. And the reason for that would probably be the environment. It probably wasn't very, very conducive um, to life down here because we actually don't even think that the modern estuary system formed till about 6,000 years ago. But as the coastal estuary was formed with its network of interlocking bays, inlets, rivers, channels, and hundreds of islands, it provided a rich natural habitat for the water-based Calusa culture that later evolved. Pine Island was a very important location to the Calusa Indians since at least as far back as 2,000 years and perhaps even further because it's really always been a rich estuary in terms of fishing resources, shell fishing. All of these resources were key to the Calusa since really the majority of their diet was from the water. They rarely ate um, animals, they did not farm, and um, the few um, gardens that we think that the Calusa had were small home gardens. The Calusa developed a complex patriarchal society where men held the power, ruled by chieftains, believed to have inherited their positions from their fathers. The sea did more than feed and nourish the Calusa. It furnished the building blocks for their homes and villages, constructed on massive mounds of shells. The more powerful the chief, the taller his house. The Calusa, who practiced human sacrifice and may have taken multiple wives, did not take kindly toward European missionaries who arrived in the 1600s and tried to persuade them to abandon their barbaric ways and convert to Christianity. These missionaries were often spurned. A lot of these Christian folks were decapitated in front of one another, um, at least one of their eyes removed, and fed to a so-called Calusa god who enjoyed eating human eyes. But even as fierce as they were, by the mid-19th century, the Calusa were gone, wiped out by disease imported by the Europeans or captured and carried off by slave traders. We think that in about the mid-1700s that the last of the people that we call Calusa were actually forcibly removed from these areas, including all of Charlotte Harbor region, as well as the Pine Island um, area itself. And we think that this was a result primarily of slavery. People uh, descended from the Creek Indians, known um, in one case as the Yemassee, had been um, working with the British in the Carolinas. And the British had provided firearms and other goods to these folks and told them basically that they needed to provide slaves. Pine Island, once the heart of a thriving culture, became a virtually deserted nautical outpost. 
So effectively, Pine Island was abandoned in a sense. It went from being this major um, cultural center and village um, to basically being a place that um, fishing people started to discover. And there's also some known history about pirates in the area. One British pirate in particular named Brew Baker was in the area that's now known as Bochelia, which is at the northern tip of Pine Island. Cuban fishermen who had dealt with the Calusa found the island fertile ground, even adopting fishing techniques developed by their Native American predecessors. The Cubans came over. They took a lot of the Indians as slaves back to their country. They also hired them as, uh, to work on the fish boats and things like that. So uh, they were involved here, and of course there were some intermarriages and things like that with the people here on our island. So we do have a lot of, of the Spanish names. Soon after the Calusa Indians left Southwest Florida in the mid-1750s, we start to see the arrival of what are called Cuban fisher folk, who we think took advantage of the rich local estuaries in the areas around Yuseppa Island as well as Pine Island. And we know about these folks not just from local history that was recorded, but also from a number of Cuban artifacts that were recovered on Pine Island sites, including rather the Pineland site, and also including the Yuseppa Island sites. We know of one individual, um, a Cuban fisherman in particular, Juan Caldez, who had an operation on Yuseppa Island. And I believe that his home has actually been identified by archeologists. Pine Island's identity as a fishing community was established by the Calusa and solidified by the Cubans. But it would take another hundred years and a Scandinavian sailor to turn it into a permanent settlement. People would come here and evidently would stay just a while, short while, move on, maybe after a few months and so forth. Most of them were fishermen. And finally, in 1873, Captain John Smith came to Pine Island and brought his family here. He had lived over on the mainland and had a hurricane at that where he was and decided that Pine Island didn't, so he thought he would come here and live. So that was, he brought his children and his wife with him. We still have some of those people on the island from his family. It seems somehow fitting that Pine Island's first permanent settler would draw his livelihood from the sea. He went out and he would take people fishing. And you have to remember back at that time, that would have been in rowboats and things like that, but he would be their guide and take them out. That was his living. Well, it attracted people and slowly more people started coming out. And so that's how we got started being on Pine Island and making a community. The lure of fishing in a warm water paradise soon began drawing tourists and visitors from across the land. And by 1880, the community of St. James on the southern tip of the island was growing. A group of northern investors built a resort called St. James on the Gulf with the 50-room San Carlos Hotel as its centerpiece. But the company folded in the early 1900s and the hotel later burned down. Through the years, farming, raising cattle, logging, even Cecil hemp rope production, all were woven into Pine Island's economic fabric. But practically from the day man first set foot on the island, fishing, both sport and commercial, has been the backbone of its culture of self-determination. The fishing community is a very essential part of that. Uh, they very much contribute to the independence of, of uh, Pine Island, and they're still here. The state's burgeoning population, coupled with the growing popularity of Florida fishing, was not without a downside. The more people who went fishing, the more fish that were caught. And ultimately, that meant fewer fish to catch. Sport fishermen and the guides and charter captains who served them blamed commercial net fishermen for depleting the fisheries. In 1994, the issue went before voters, and Floridians adopted a constitutional amendment banning so-called entanglement nets. It took effect the following year. That was a major, but not yet fatal, blow to the commercial fishing industry on Pine Island. The so-called net ban wasn't really a net ban, it was net restrictions. And we still have people on the island who still make their living with fishing nets and uh, seem to do rather well at it. 
It also gave birth to a new breed of commercial fishing, aquaculture. Farmers buy tiny seed clams, raise them on shore in trays, then plant them at the bottom of the bay in mesh bags. Fifteen Lee County clam farms sold an estimated 10 million clams in 2003, a $1.3 million crop. Got the farm raised clam. Pine Island's southern location and its rich estuary system offer great potential for the clam farm industry. But if hopes are high, so are the risks. Aquaculture clam farms is a growing industry, but I don't see it growing all that fast. Uh, they've had an awful lot of bad luck. Uh, it takes a couple of years to grow a clam to the point where it's ready for market, and then along comes a, a red tide bloom, and you're closed down for until the bloom leaves. Try again, and then along came Hurricane Charlie, which was when the clams again were ready for market, but that ended that. So it's, it's a risky business, and it's also a lot of hard work. Uh, you have to learn to be a diver. Uh, it, it'll work for some people, but I don't see it turning into a giant industry. Southwest Florida was mostly frontier around the turn of the 20th century, and life was even harder on Pine Island, cut off as it was from the mainland by water on all sides. The first folks who lived out here were really um, mail carriers, and a lot of them would commit to um, taking long um, boat trips after taking a mule-driven cart, even across the length of the island. Of course, the roads were paved with dirt, with some fill from the shell mounds. You have to remember, if you were going to live on Pine Island years ago, and I'm going back quite a ways, you would have had a lot of mosquitoes. We complain about mosquitoes now but you would have had a lot of bugs. That would have been one thing. You would have had uh, not running water. You would not have had electric. You would not have had television. Food had to be brought in, like your staples, like flour and sugar. Maybe the housewife needed material because they made all their own clothes usually. Things like that, and you would go down and tell the captain that came out here with a ferry and brought the mail and so forth three times a week and say, hey, I'm going to have a party next week and I need ice. In 1926, work got underway to build a swing bridge over Matlache Pass, linking Pine Island with the mainland. Construction was set back by the hurricane of 26 and the span finally opened in 1927, shortening the trip to Fort Myers by boat by two days. The bridge brought special joy to the life of Harry Stringfellow, who had moved to Pine Island in 1900. Stringfellow was a Lee County commissioner, and attending a meeting in Fort Myers took three days of his time, including mule-drawn wagon and steamer rides across San Carlos Bay. Stringfellow was instrumental in developing a network of roads on Pine Island, and the 17-mile highway that dissects the island from Boquilla to St. James City bears his name today. At the time the bridge opened, however, no one dreamed it would soon earn an international reputation. During World War II, thousands of young airmen trained at Page Field in Fort Myers and the Buckingham Air Base in East Lee County. It didn't take them long to learn how to have a good time without having to spend a lot of money. Like the Calusa and the Cubans before them, these young flyers embraced the joys of fishing the fertile waters around Pine Island. They soldiers found out they loved to fish, didn't have much money to be running around or anything, they could come out here and fish. And I have, we have pictures here of them lined up and they, they get so full of people, the bridge would, that they'd push each other off. So that is the story, some lady said, this is the fishingest bridge in the world and that's why it's still called that. A new concrete bridge was built in 1969 and plans were approved to start work on a replacement in 2008. The ancient Calusa were a study in contradictions. Battle-hardened and warlike, they maintained a standing army and gave no quarter to their perceived enemies. 
Yet that ferocity was tempered by an uncharacteristically artistic side. One might think that a group with such a focus on war and with a whole class of society devoted to warriors um, might be more committed to that than to other pursuits. However, we know that they were also amazing artists. A number of pieces, not only wooden figurines, but also wooden face masks, very brightly painted tableaus of other animals, especially fish, alligators, wolves, cats, have all been discovered, especially at the Key Marco site. And additionally, carved bone implements, probably hairpins that were elaborately carved out of deer bone fragments, have also been found, including on Pine Island. Archaeologists speculate that artistic bent may have simply been the result of easy living and good fishing. The reason we think this is, is because the estuaries were so rich that these people were able to actually live in one area and focus on a variety of tasks. It doesn't take a long time, if you're in a rich environment, to catch fish. And what that means is that you have the rest of your day to do social activities, to play music, to pursue things like art. So perhaps it was the ancient ghosts of the Calusa or maybe the laid-back, live-and-let-live, barefoot lifestyle had something to do with it. But somewhere along its journey through time, a funny thing happened to Pine Island. It became a hotbed for the arts, attracting painters, writers, sculptors, all of whom filled the galleries and made an indelible mark on the community, leaving it ablaze in colorful buildings, colorful artwork, and colorful personalities. Pine Island boasts a number of writers, and um, artists, uh, many of whom are internationally known. So there is kind of this independent creative sense about the island, which again reminds me of the earliest residents here. There was kind of this energy and creative force here since at least 2,000 years ago. One sure way to get labeled a tourist on Pine Island is to mispronounce the name of the funky little artistic enclave that serves as the portal to the island. It is not Matlacha but no one seems certain just where the name Matt Lachey originated. Some sources say that Matt Lachey is an Indian word for water up to your neck, which is an interesting name because in fact, the water today is shallow and at low tide, you could actually walk across part of the Pine Island Sound. Another theory though, is that Matt Lachey might have meant warrior or defender. And the problem with any of this, of course, is its oral history, and there are no Calusa Indians around now to explain whether this is true or not. So it's really all folklore. Legend has it that St. James City was named by Jesuit missionaries who tried to establish a mission in their saint's name at the southern tip of Pine Island, only to be driven off by the Calusa. And the origin of the name Boquilla at the northern tip of Pine Island? We think that is a new form of a Spanish word, bocilla, which means little mouth, just as boca grande means large mouth. And again, this all goes back to the days of seafaring, fishing, and of course the pirates, basically terrorists out here. Still, there's a lot of local lore about what those folks did. But as far as we know, there is no buried treasure on Pine Island. Ironically, the island's name itself may no longer be a good fit. Pine Island, of course, was originally named because of the high number of pine trees out here. Sadly, in my opinion, there are not many pine trees out here anymore. There was a great deal of logging, of course, and a lot of those trees were actually felled and brought out for construction in other places. What is good to note, though, is that a number of the historic homes out here were built with Pine Island pine, which has a great reputation as being a very long-lasting and sturdy wood those pine groves have largely given way to a proliferation of palm tree plantations, prompting tongue-in-cheek suggestions that perhaps the name might have to be changed to Palm Island. The palm plantations are our current biggest threat on Pine Island. The, uh, we all thought it was over a few years ago that perhaps the palm farms had expanded to their maximum, but it's not true. They're, they're still buying up every single acre of native forestry on Pine Island and turning it into palm farms. No, I wouldn't be in favor of changing the name, but the point is well taken. It's a palm farm. In some ways, Pine Island is the antithesis of what people have come to expect of Florida. It doesn't have rampant development or miles of sandy beaches lined with posh resorts and high-rise condos. Most Pine Islanders like it just fine that way. Well, we like it out here. We like the quietness. Uh, we like the environment. Uh, 
And when we go to the mainland, we, we really feel like we're in a foreign country. Uh, yeah, I don't think it's my imagination, but it's hotter and more miserable over there. <laughs> it's, uh, it's just not Pine Island. It was no accident that Pine Island managed to hold on to its past. Much of the credit for keeping fragile wetlands out of the hands of developers goes to the Calusa Land Trust, of which Phil Buchanan is a former president. We have uh, 2,000 acres preserved right now, and most of our work these days is working with the 2020 program as partners. It's been immensely successful, but uh, it, that's, this is in its 30th, 31st year this year, the Calusa Land Trust. It's one of the most successful local land trusts in the entire country, and it's strictly Pine Island. Development is also held in check by a land plan 20 years in the making, the so-called 910 rule that restricts development when traffic counts through Matt Lache reach 910 vehicles per hour during peak travel times. Buchanan credits the nature of Pine Islanders for getting that plan approved by Lee County commissioners. The people of Pine Island did it. They attended meetings in Fort Myers by the hundreds. They, they attended meetings out here. We had one meeting, 350 people. Uh, the vote to, uh, for the land plan was 350 to nine, I think it was. Uh, that's the way it goes out here. These people, uh, I suppose islands are a lot like that. Mountaineers are like that too, fierce and independent and uh, very defensive of their, their own space. Pine Island may have resisted development, but one project that was welcomed came back in 1980 when the first shopping center and supermarket opened on Stringfellow Road, just south of Pine Island Center, cutting down dramatically on those dreaded trips to the mainland. When we moved here, we had to go clear into Cape Coral or Fort Myers to get our groceries and drugs, anything drugstore that you would need and things like that. And I think it was 18 or 19 years ago that when Dixie, uh, we have this little mall here at the center of the island, and they came in and uh, at that time, I believe it was Eckerd Drug Store and so forth. There's the liquor store and beauty shop and so forth up there. And that was a blessing, as you say that uh, we didn't have to run into town. Spend some time on Pine Island and eventually you'll sense a degree of latent distrust or even downright resentment toward its next door neighbor. There is a great deal of suspicion on Pine Island as regards Cape Coral and that, it's for good reason. Uh, our philosophies are entirely different. Uh, I read the, uh, the, the press every day and uh, I see the attitudes and whatnot in Cape Coral and there couldn't be more job couldn't be more opposed to the way we do business on Pine Island. Uh, Cape Coral seems to think uh, more development the better. Uh, we're just the other way around. Uh, we're also a little bit uh, intimidated by our big neighbor to the east. I mean, what if they want to expand? There's only one direction to go, and that's toward us, and we don't want any parts of that. Uh, we've even looked at the annexation laws in Florida, and they're fairly easy for cities to annex things. So yes, I think we have good reason to be intimidated by our big neighbor to the east. With several thousand years of stubborn self-determination written in the pages of its history book, why hasn't Pine Island incorporated itself and declared independence from Lee County? We have considered incorporation. We considered it uh, very seriously just a couple years ago. But there was a serious question about whether the county commissioners were going to enforce the 910 rule. And when that was, uh, when it was seriously questioned, uh, we looked at incorporation as an alternative. And had the 910 rule not been enforced, uh, we would have pursued incorporation. We, in fact, spent a bunch of money, did a, did a uh, feasibility survey, found it was financially feasible, and we're ready to proceed on it as a backup system. There is something about Pine Island that engenders a passionate sense of place among those who call it home. For some of them, it is a traumatic experience to venture across the bridge at Matt Lachey. Everybody on Pine Island says that they don't like to leave uh, Pine Island at all and they only go to the mainland when they have to. And uh, I think that's largely true. You know, I've heard that people say to me, I never want to leave Pine Island. I don't care if I go off Pine Island. I don't want to go off Pine Island. First of all, we don't like all that traffic, I guess. Uh, the gasoline might right now might have something to do with that. But uh, yes, I've had people say, when I leave Pine Island permanently, it's going to be in a casket. So there you are. That's how we all love it, and I mean, a lot of people do anyway. This 17-mile-long waterbound community has a richly textured history framed by a parade of diverse cultures. 
Pine Islanders seem keenly aware of the legacy of independence and downright feistiness handed them by their predecessors. And while much of Southwest Florida looks eagerly to the future with visions of growth, development, and prosperity dancing in its head, Pine Islanders look fondly to the past. They know in their hearts it can't be brought back, but neither are they anxious to see rampant change come barreling west down Pine Island Road. Ask a longtime Pine Islander what his island should look like in 10 or 20 years, and the answer you get may sound something like this, pretty much the way it is now. Pine Island is very much a different world out here. It's not just the environment, it's also the people. People out here sometimes haven't locked their doors in 20 or 30 years now. How many places in the United States can you, can you find that? To purchase a copy of this and other WGCU-produced programs, go to WGCU.org or call 1-888-824-0030. This program was produced for the citizens of Southwest Florida by WGCU Public Media. Show your appreciation for programs like these. Become a member of WGCU, a business supporter, or leave a legacy through a state or planned gift. Call or visit our website at WGCU.org.